a little bit of context to the to next uh, half hour. Um, I split up the presentation into two sections. The first half-ish uh, is a quick overview of the social media landscape, uh, where we were three years ago, where we are now, what it means for your business, why you should listen, why you should find it important. Uh, and then the second half is uh, broken down into three tips to think about uh, when you're developing your social strategy or executing your social strategy. Uh, and then embedded throughout those tips, I've just basically listed off a whole bunch of free and paid tools um, that, I th that I personally find beneficial uh, and I think you would find beneficial as well for helping you manage social. Just uh, to get a bit of context to who's in, uh, who's in the room today, um, can you just put your hands up if you own a business or, or, or work for a business that doesn't have a social media presence? Super. One. That's good. That's good because I'm hoping for a couple. Um, so, okay, everyone play along. Put your hands up if you uh, do have a social media presence. I'm going to ask people to put it. Put your hands down. No, nope, keep them up. Put your hand down, hands down if you have um, a dedicated person managing social. So keep your hands up, sorry, if you have a dedicated person managing social. The rest down. Super. Keep your hands up if you've got a dedicated team, so more than one person managing social. Put your hands down if you haven't. So a couple of teams. Right. To set a bit of context, this talk is about the lower end of the scale, the SMEs, the smaller businesses, the one-man band, the, 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 person, the, team, the businesses that have a dedicated person. Once you scale into teams, um, some of these tools are a little le less relevant because you'll probably be looking at enterprise tools, but I'll talk slightly to that as, as well. Where we're talking about tools and technology um, is basically this. If you were looking at, if you were here for the Brand Watch uh, talk, you would have seen uh, this slide. Um, this is basically the marketing technology landscape currently as it stands. Um, there's 1,874 pieces of software that can help you manage your marketing activities. Uh, everything from uh, SRPs to SMMTs to CRMs connected to CMSs all connected by APIs, it all gets a, very, a little bit confusing. Um, so I'm here to give you a little bit of uh, some tips, some advice on which ones you can uh, effectively use, free and paid, to help you, you manage social. And in context to what I just mentioned, this is kind of the, the uh, I suppose, the social media maturity scale of, of any organization, and um, probably something you'll step through as you look to scale your social media maturity. Uh, most, if not all, of companies start at the bottom, uh, well, at the left here, um, with social advocates. This might be you right now, which is not a bad thing, and this might always be you if you just stick with a dedicated person managing social. But even if you're a larger enterprise or a larger organization, um, you probably would have started at this stage of the, the maturity scale. So basically someone saying, I get social, um, I think I can run social or manage social for, for our company, let me start a Facebook page or let me start a Twitter profile and start pushing some content out there and uh, maybe building a fan base of some kind. Um, so kind of ad, ad hoc activity on social. As you step through the social media maturity scale, you then start to see the power of social. You then start to potentially look at dedicated individuals that can manage social media for you, um, managing social strategies, normally within a marketing or PR function of some kind, um, looking to create content, publish content, get some awareness about your brand, potentially get some leads in if you're in a B2B, uh, if you're working B2B and looking to manage your B2B social strategy but effectively having a dedicated person, which is where many of you are uh, today in the room. Uh, and then as you scale into a kind of full social maturity, we find a lot of organizations uh, end up at the, the far end scale. So this is where you do not have a dedicated team, or you have multiple people, but social media, um, the responsibility for social media is spread across all of the teams. So you may have a social marketing function or social marketing strategy, social HR, where your HR team might be trained to use LinkedIn effectively to uh, recruit talent or target talent, reducing the overheads that you have to spend um, using recruitment agents 
agencies. You might have a social selling strategy where your sales team are trained to use LinkedIn to target new prospects or trained to set up some listening tools um, to monitor for anyone uh, asking questions about your product or services on social. And that might be your sales team trained to do that. Um, or you, and then you might have a customer service team and a social customer care strategy where actually the customer care and so customer service teams are trained to effectively use Facebook, for instance, to, to manage any queries that are, that, are, that are coming through the social channels uh, and effectively respond to those in, in real time and manage that customer care function um, where social media effectively is therefore distributed across an, the organization. Uh, and this is a typical social media maturity scale. Uh, and for the purposes of my talk, I'm going to focus on this side of the, uh, the maturity scale today. So we all know the, the power of social media and the impact that it has on our daily lives. Um, social media has been used to elect governments uh, like the highly coveted Yes uh, campaign from Obama. Obama using Facebook and Twitter and YouTube to talk to his audiences directly. Even recently, you might have seen Obama doing partnerships with BuzzFeed, creating YouTube videos. I think the latest Obama video on BuzzFeed had 18 million views. Um, so Obama effectively using social media to communicate to, to his audiences. Social media is also used to overthrow governments, uh, like the Egyptian uprising, uh, the Arab Spring. Facebook and Twitter was actually used to coordinate protests, uh, Egypt going as far as shutting down access to Facebook and Twitter so that people couldn't use those to, to, to communicate with each other. We know the power of social as a lifeline when uh, natural disasters strike. Uh, this is a Japanese tsunami. Red Cross actually used Facebook and Twitter to monitor other charity drops, rescue drops, to see where they were dropping packages so they could effectively reach more people and make sure they weren't overlapping with, with their drops. And we also know the power of social media when smaller disasters strike. I think uh, Brown Watch mentioned this in their talk earlier. Um, 2012, if anyone watched the Super Bowl, uh, probably not. It was like 3 o'clock in the morning, it's around the time. But um, if, you'd, if you watched it, you would have seen there was a power cut at half time. The stadium went completely black, pitch black. Um, all you could see was people's phones of them trying to take selfies of themselves in the dark, which makes absolutely no sense uh, whatsoever. Uh, but Oreo Cookie going out and tweeting, don't worry, you can still dunk in the dark. Uh, within two and a half minutes, it was retweeted 12,000 times. Within 24 hours, it was seen by two and a half million people. Um, more people saw the tweet itself um, than saw their 30 second Super Bowl ad, which cost them three and a half million dollars. Um, so it shows you the power of social media in terms of a timely, reactive, relevant sense. Um, but why should we care? Smaller businesses, these big companies, big agencies, there's a rumor floating around, I don't know, but they, they had a, a, a war, their agency, Oreo Cookie Agency, had a war room with 25 people sat in managing social for them during the game. Um, so why should we care as a, as a small business? Well, Gartner released a report um, just last year that said one in four companies will lose market dominance by 2017 due to social business incompetence. Um, if you dig around, if you dig a little bit deeper into that Gartner report, it, it actually says, uh, social business incompetence is a bit of a harsh word, but basically being able to connect the dots between social media activity and business value. Um, being able to understand how social media can support your sales strategy, can support your customer care strategy, can reduce the overheads that you need to spend on customer care teams or t telephone um, customer service teams, um, and effectively use social to drive towards business goals. The same report that said that one in five of those companies will see dominance by 2017 due to a company founded after 2000 because companies after 2000 get and understand the power of social media and how it can be used to actually deliver business value for you. Um, there was another report by Brian Solis, who's a, um, a digital strategist, um, automator strategist based out in Silicon Valley. He uh, used the term social business incompetence as well. Um, and he actually said the problem is half of executives in, in companies aren't engaged in social media. Um, not engaged in the sense of them using Facebook and Twitter and Snapchat to take selfies of themselves and stalk their friends and uh, family on Facebook, but using and being engaged in social media in terms of understanding how it can meet business goals. Um, I thought I'd use this example because this is an example uh, from an example of um, 
an executive that is engaged in social media and kind of typif typifies the general social media conversations or Twitter conversations. Um, our friend here, Jay Rooney, I don't know if you can see it at the back, but at Rambling Rooney, has just found out that T-Mobile doesn't charge extra for overseas data. What the hell is he doing with AT&T? T-Mobile obviously listening, they've got their social listening tools set up. Um, you know there's an alternative to old school wireless carriers, right? It's called T-Mobile, the hashtag uncarrier. AT&T, gloves are off, they're listening. Resist the urge, Jay. We heard it's dark and scary and no one can ever hear you over at T-Mobile. No one. Jay Rooney, so this kind of typifies most Twitter conversations. Could be persuaded by a discount. Who doesn't like a freebie, right? I think this is me after every brand conversation. Can you give me a freebie? Um, T-Mobile, gloves are really off. Did your kindergarten panel write that for you, AT&T? Uh, Jay, Rambling Rooney, come over to T-Mobile. Global data, global data at no extra charge versus dollars. Hashtag, it's not complicated. Uh, AT&T, no gloves out here, Jay. It's too close to the holidays to be so disgruntled. Uh, but here's the uppercut. John Lager, T-Mobile CEO. That AT&T CEO isn't going to join the conversation. Uh, come join the hashtag wireless revolution. Uh, and then the output, Jay Rooney, you definitely caught my attention, good sir, going to T-Mobile store tomorrow to inquire. Now, obviously this doesn't scale. Um, John Lager can't answer the 100,000 customer service tweets that they probably receive on a monthly basis. Um, but what it does show you is the immediate impact social media has when, first of all, you're there to listen to these conversations, um, because these conversations are happening already, um, with or without you. If not about your brand, they're definitely happening about your products, your services, your competitors, the industry as a whole. Um, the, all of these conversations are happening on social, in the public sphere, um, which at a very basic level is insight uh, for you. Insight that you can effectively just use social to listen, to pull all of this data, to automate the listening, just get it sent into your inbox so you can at least understand what conversations are being had about your products, your service, your competitors, your industry. And then once you've listened, to actually have a conversation with these customers and potential customers. Um, because that's the only reason we use social, right? A, is to have a conversation with someone. If it's to have a conversation with our friends, our family, our peers, but also when we interact and engage with brands and businesses on social, to have a conversation with someone at the other end. Um, and if you're not there to react to those conversations and that content, someone else will be, your competitors will be, or their friends and family will go and react and potentially recommend other products, other services, competitor products, competitor services. Uh, and these are happening. Um, and I'm going to speak to you later, in a, shortly in a second, about how you can uh, develop a social strategy to, to pick up on these conversations. So how do we adapt? Um, well, there was a, a report from, um, I think it was Recruit Indeed site that said, in the last year alone, job roles uh, advertised on the recruitment site for social media manager decreased by 50%. So half as many companies are looking for social media managers. Uh, no one's looking for social media managers anymore. In context, the year before they quadrupled, the year before they tripled. Um, but the same report said that, Job descriptions with job roles with social media in the description increased by 13 times. Um, everyone from the email marketing assistant to the customer service rep to the sales rep to the VPs to the CEOs or MDs of companies uh, have now a responsibility for social media, a responsibility for personal branding, a responsibility for business branding, a responsibility for understanding how you can build a strategy that would deliver, deliver business goals. So if we take a look at just a quick context, uh, the, the, just the social media landscape over the last three years, which is going to set the scene for some strategy stuff. Um, two years ago, 2013, um, the year of the land grab. Um, so businesses, brands, people trying to get as many fans and followers as possible. How many fans can I get on my Facebook page? How many followers can I get on my Twitter feed? Um, brands going out and businesses going out and buying fake fans and followers to unnaturally inflate their egos. Um, you can do that now. Go to eBay, buy a thousand fans and you can get, for a hundred dollars you can get a thousand fans on your Facebook page or, or your Twitter profile. Please no one do that. I do not advocate for that whatsoever. Um, but 30, 2013, the year of how many fans can I get? The land grab. 2014, last year, the year of engagement. Um, 
brands and businesses uh, trying to get as much engagement as possible. How many likes, comments, shares, retweets can I get? Um, brands and businesses running retweet and follow me campaigns to win an iPad on Twitter to try and get as many retweets as possible, probably from people that will never ever buy from you anyway and probably more likely just competition hunters that are going around retweeting everyone's bit of content that provide absolutely zilch value for you and your, your business itself. Brands and businesses actually coming up to us on the agency side and saying, can you work out our engagement rate for us? Uh, what's our engagement rate of our Facebook page as a percentage of our fan base? Um, which is absolutely screwed because you've just gone and bought a million fake fans and followers, so your engagement rate is 0.001%, uh, which means nothing to, uh, to no one. But the year of engagement. To uh, 2015 uh, and, and beyond. Um, the years of advocacy. So targeting a much smaller group of people, um, a much smaller group of customers, customers who not only use your products and services, but love what your products and services allow them to do, achieve, um, and targeting this much smaller community of advocates, um, giving them content that they'll consume, that they'll share themselves, that they'll engage with, uh, and letting them do the work. Uh, letting them engage with a bit of content, which will then filter out to their friends and family. The power of seven, everyone has seven contacts, seven friends. Um, on platforms is slightly different, um, but I'm going to go to it in a second and I'll show you what I mean. But effectively targeting a much smaller group of people, not aiming for all of these fans, and not aiming for uh, all of this fake engagement, not that there's not a place for fans and engagement. Of course, there's a place for an audience and there's a, there's a place for an engaged audience, but the right type of audience with the right type of engagement that will deliver you some sort of business value, whether that's growing brand awareness, whether that's selling products, whether that's driving loyalty and, and, and advocacy with your, with your customers and getting them to share um, out for you. Um, and I wanted to caveat that with, I'm going to talk a lot about technology and tools that will help you. Um, but in general, we need to stop worrying about technology and the platforms and the 1,876 pieces of software you can use. And start worrying about who trusts you when you're using that technology and when you're having a conversation with them. And if you're blanket pushing content out, blanket creating email campaigns and pushing everything out, uh, throwing spaghetti at a wall and hoping something will stick, um, it's going to cost you a lot of time, effort, and budget for le very little return. So we need to start thinking about not social at scale, um, not optimal times to post, um, not best type, best, best type of content even, um, but actually are we building relationships with people that we're actually having conversations with? And it's about building meaningful relationships with the people that you're conversing, you're conversing with. So going on to my uh, tools and my three tips uh, and some tools. So first of all, as I mentioned, insight. Uh, first tip, don't do a thing without listening. Uh, far too many times have, we, have I spoken to smaller businesses and I ask them what, uh, what social presence they have. And then we're on a Facebook, we've got a Facebook page, a Twitter profile, we try Google+, we're on LinkedIn, um, we're on YouTube, we've got a few videos on there and we're just trying Pinterest. Uh, and I'm like, why? And they're like, well, because everyone else is doing it. Um, well, no, well, your audiences might not be there. Um, and the platforms actually give you an opportunity to see who's there, see who's having conversations before you even step into any social media activity. Um, and what I mean by that is if you think about your conversation funnel, your sales funnel, um, this might not be your funnel. This is a traditional funnel. If you're in B2B, it might be slightly different or it might be horizontal. But, but as an example, this is your typical sales and conversation funnel. Um, awareness through to preference, through to purchase, and then loyalty and advocacy. If we take uh, a purchase, um, a car purchase, for instance, let's take a, a high end, difficult to get loyalty, I'm buying a car. Awareness, I'm looking to change my car. I want something new. Um, can anyone recommend uh, any, any, or can anyone give, us, give me any, any advice on what type of cars I should get? Consideration, I'm thinking, something economical. Should I go diesel? Should I go electric? Preference. I like Tesla. I think I look cool in a Tesla. Um, I want to get a Tesla. Purchase. I have bought a Tesla. Loyalty. I love my Tesla. Advocacy. You should buy a Tesla. You can see every single one of those conversations happening on social all the way down the sales funnel. Whether that's people asking for recommendations, asking for advice. Uh, should I get A versus B? Uh, whether that's 
purchasing, people saying they've just purchased the product, someone taking a selfie of themselves in a car, um, someone telling bra their friends and family they just bought something or they delivered the last deliveries just arrived or the newest deliveries just arrived, or whether that's loyalty and advocacy. People sharing that they love a product. Um, people seeing other people asking for advice and recommending a product or a service or a brand to them because they've had a good experience with them. Conversations happen all the way down the sales funnel. Very different depending on the products, the services that you offer, uh, whether you're B2B or B2C. Um, but it's your responsibility as a practitioner, as a, as a, a business owner, as a marketing practitioner, whoever it is that, in whatever context that you manage social within your organization. But it's your responsibility to break down this funnel and be super focused about where you're spending your time. I'm a brand new business. I just started up last week. There's no point focusing on loyalty and advocacy when no one's talking about you. It's about creating brand awareness, getting content out there, looking for partnerships where people might be able to share your content. So I'm going to develop a social strategy that will focus on creating content and pushing it out there. Or actually, I'm a business that's been around 15 years. Um, I have a lot of people already talking about me. So actually, I'm going to focus my strategy specifically on my customers and advocates. And I'm literally going to create a forum or a place where my top customers can come, um, talk about the products, share information with each other. And then subtly, I'm going to ask them to share content. I'm going to give content to them because I know they love my products. I know they're already talking about my products. So I'll get them to share out. Um, and I'll get them to, to do the work for me. Um, it's your responsibility to break this down and focus your strategy very specifically on that. And then there's tools uh, and technologies that will help you do that along the way. Um, some listening tools that I want to uh, speak to you about. Uh, again, if you're on the enterprise play, you would have heard of these, you would have used these. It's more on the SMB market. Uh, TweetDeck, uh, if you use Twitter uh, specifically, TweetDeck's a great free platform owned by Twitter. You can basically pull streams. This is just something I copied and pasted from TweetDeck this morning. Um, you can create Twitter lists um, on Twitter, so you can um, segment your audience. You see, I've got a, a list here for digital people on my Twitter profile. I have a list here, you can't see it, which is there's a, there's a publication called The Drum, marketing publication. Anyone that works at The Drum, I have them in a list, just in case I can engage with them, and they might, uh, there might be an opportunity to, to engage with journalists, and they want to post my and publish my content. I have a list for friends, I have a list for customers, I even have a list for competitors, digital consultancy competitors, separate list on a separate tab, and I can monitor exactly what they're doing, um, and just for my own sake, flick through every now and again to see, to see what they're doing. Uh, TweetDeck's a great free tool. Um, Twitter only, as by the name. Um, next up, Hootsuite, another great free tool. Very similar, it's a similar layout, but also Facebook, uh, Google+, LinkedIn, YouTube, Pinterest-ish. Uh, you can pull in all your different social networks and have about 180 app integrations. So if you use MailChimp or Constant Contact for email marketing, you can integrate that and put it all into one platform. Again, a free tool. Uh, and the SMB platform is £10 a month. They have a very powerful enterprise platform. I'm ex Hootsuite, so I'm not going to talk too much about them, but you can, uh, you can manage them, you can have a look online about those. So that's listening, pulling in feeds, and just seeing the content come through on your mobile every now and again. Uh, Google Alerts. Um, hopefully you use Google Alerts, it's a free Google tool. Um, set up a Google Alert, put it into Google. Um, any keyword mention online, on a blog, on a forum, on a website, it will send you an email notification of all those mentions. Put your brand name in, put your products, put your competitors in. I put dog walking in, I might own a dog walking business and I want to see what people are talking about. Um, every, every day or as it happens, it will send you an email with all of the, the latest public, um, content that's been published online. Great for content generation. Um, or you can scale up. Mention is a great tool for listening. I get another free, actually no free trial. They've just switched to an SMB plan. Uh, it's less than 100, 100 pounds, I think. Um, but basically similar, you plug in keywords, but it crawls about a million different sources in 42 languages for those keyword mentions. Pings you an email anytime that keyword has been mentioned online, anywhere. Caveat that with if it's not behind a firewall so you can't get to people's private Facebook walls and things like that, but it will collate that. Again, great listening tool, just pings it to your inbox, start learning, see what people are talking about. Uh, bonus one for competitors, Riffle, 
if anyone's, spoke, uh, if anyone's seen this, another free tool. You can basically plug in a Twitter profile and it'll give you loads of information about people's Twitter profile. Here's a digital marketing show. Top hashtags used, top mentions from various uh, influencers. It'll even tell you how much they've engaged with people, how many tweets they sent, um, how, many people, how many times they engage with their audiences. Again, all free. Um, and this one integrates with Hootsuite, which is great. Um, so it gives you some nice competitor insight for free. Um, and then BuzzSumo is another one for influencers. So if you're listening and you want to listen uh, to, to see what influencers are talking about content, BuzzSumo, you plug in a keyword, dog walking, um, and then it will, say, it will pull back all of the mentions of dog walking, but rated by how many times they've been shared. So you can see what content is, most, is being engaged uh, most or people are mostly interacting with online. Great, again, for content generation. If you're stuck for content topics or ideas, you can see what's resonating. Uh, and it will also, there's a little tab for influencers. It will pull out all the influencers um, on Twitter and on social so you can interact with them and, and think about influencer campaigns. I'll share these slides with you uh, later. Uh, and then some enterprise ones as we scale into listening. Brandwatch were on earlier, um, and Sysmos were on about two talks ago, both deep listening tools. So basically, they go, they go back retrospectively. They can go back two years, keyword-based, pull back over 100 million sources worth of content, pulls it all into something you can manage. Great for really big data, deep listening, uh, look at competitive trends, campaigns, see what works, see what doesn't work. This is enterprise level, so it is licensed, and it will cost you an amount. Um, I believe Sysmos had the booth and Brandwatch for around for the next two days, but research them online if you're looking to invest in a much more sophisticated listening tool. Tip two, got about 10 minutes. Um, tip two, respect the platform. So these are, this is a, a diagram from Biden Solis again of every social network that's currently live. Over 480 social networks that you can use. Um, all the BMOFs as you'd expect, uh, but also smaller social networks or more niche social networks. Wayne.com is a travel social network, has 20 million people on the social network talking about travel and leisure. Um, if you work in travel, leisure, hospitality, that might be one you want to explore rather than trying to attack Facebook or Twitter. Um, a much more targeted, much more niche platform, sportslobster.com. Something like 15 million people talking about sports. If you work in sports uh, or in that industry, that might be a social network that you might want to target. The point being, there's lots of different platforms. It's not always about the behemoths. Um, so do the research, see what's out there. There might be a much more targeted uh, uh, platform that you can use. But when people do ask us where, which social networks do we use, um, where should we go, as granddad say everywhere, uh, fish where the fish are biting, uh, go where your audiences are. If you don't know, ask them. If you have a bricks and mortar store, ask them when they walk in through the front door. If you have an email database, survey them. Which social networks do you use? Um, poll them. Um, create a Twitter profile and run a poll um, and get some insight about where people are using, uh, what, where your customers are, uh, which platforms your customers are using from a social media perspective. If you wanted to make some assumptions, you could probably make some assumptions. The big ones are probably where they'll be. Uh, top four here, top five Google Plus, but I've, uh, I've uh, removed that one. Uh, but these are the top four. Facebook, 300 million active users in Europe. Um, the latest report was that on average, a person logs onto Facebook 14 times a day, which is ridiculous. Um, but it is the BMOF, and you could assume that your customers are probably using Facebook. Um, Instagram, nice, these are aggregated figures, so these are not exact, but uh, 90 million active users across Europe. Twitter, 70 million active users. LinkedIn, 45. The point being, on my respect the, the platform um, topic, or tip, every single one of these has a nuance. Facebook, great for community building, great for paid media, a super powerful paid media platform. I can spend five pounds and put my content in front of someone. Um, if I'm a hairdresser, for instance, I can put my content in front of someone, uh, a male who's aged 18 to 24, who uh, likes fashion and is interested in horse riding, who lives in Croydon. Um, and I can be super targeted and tell Facebook, put my content in front of that person. Twitter, on the other hand, um, Facebook has a, an algorithm called EdgeRank, where it works out who's best to show your content to, which I'll go to in a second. Um, so only a small percentage will see your, your content. Twitter, on the other hand, has no algorithm. It's a mess. Um, you follow 1,000 people, you see 1,000 people's worth of content. Um, because there's no algorithm, you just see everything. Um, so if you think about these two platforms, Facebook, because it's working out 
who you should see content to, you have about a two to three day window where you might, your, your fans might be able to see your content because they might log in in two days. If Facebook thinks that fan likes your bit of content, it will put it in its news feed. Twitter, on the other hand, you have about two to three hours because it's real time. Um, as, as soon as you push it, if they're not, as soon as you push it to Twitter, if they're not looking at their Twitter feed, at the moment you send it, it's probably gone into the ether. So you have to be tweeting every two to three hours um, to make it work, ish, on average, again, aggregates. Um, do the research, um, put some time and effort into understanding these platforms because each of them has very specific nuances. Um, and as I mentioned, it's not always about building up a fan base. Uh, just to caveat my point about that Facebook algorithm, this is purely based on fa Facebook, but if you have 135 people, advocates, read employees, read volunteers, read uh, top customers. If you have 135 people sharing your content, that will reach more people than having a million Facebook fans on your Facebook feed. Um, the, the, the calculation is here if anyone wants to pull me up on it, ish. Um, but effectively, as I mentioned, Facebook has an algorithm. It works out who should see your content based on what it thinks is your best audience. Um, based on how much they interact with your content. And on average, 1.5% of your fan base will see your content when you push it to your a million Facebook fans. Um, because Facebook is working behind the scenes uh, with its algorithm to work who, who best to show that content to. So if, if a person comes to your Facebook page, likes a bit of content, Facebook says, that person must like it because it's clicked on the content. For the next four to six weeks, we'll show them that content because it must like it. If they don't click on anything else, over the next six weeks, it'll fade out and they'll never see any content in their feed because Facebook says, this person must not like that content so let's not show it to them. So on average, it will see 1.5% 1, 1 of your fan base will see your content when you publish it. Friends, on the other hand, see 33%. So 33% of uh, a friend's audience or a person's audience will see their content. And on average, um, Facebook, Facebook um, people have 338 friends. So the calculation is here, um, but basically 1.5% of a million 15,000 15, people uh, is how many people you can reach if you have a million Facebook fans. Uh, but if you have 135 people sharing your content to their friends, families, and peers, 15,100, so just. Um, but you get the point. Um, getting people to share content, um, targeting customers that find your content valuable, or customers that like your products and services, and being very targeted um, is much more valuable than chasing after these big, big numbers, um, unless you have paid media, of course. So some tips on this before I get to my last tip, I'll rush through. Uh, Facebook dark and unpublished posts. If you, if you are creating content on Facebook and publishing it, uh, you are way behind the game. As I mentioned, no one's seeing that content there or thereabouts, sweeping statement, but very limited people are seeing that content. But Facebook has a very powerful paid media platform. Dark uh, unpublished posts. Uh, I'm not going to go through it in detail, put it into Google, tons of stuff about how to use it. But effectively, what it allows you to do is segment audiences, as I mentioned, um, by keywords, by demographic, gender, age, location, everything you'd want to, to, to segment them by, creating different variations. Um, so if you're a dog walking, if I own a dog walking company, um, I can target people um, that own Labradors by typing Labrador keywords and show them a picture of a Labrador in my Facebook content. Then I might do that 20 times over targeting French Bulldogs, boxers, etc. Um, you see where I'm getting at, you can be much more focused and targeted about your content, make sure it resonates with the audience you're targeting, put it in front of the right people rather than throwing spaghetti at the wall and hoping someone's going to see it. Uh, again, this is Facebook targeting uh, on the paid side. So if you do publish organic content, you'll see a little boost button down the bottom corner. You can say boost this, put it in front of these people. Um, I want them to live within 10 miles of uh, Excel center. They need to be female, age 34, between 45. They need to like marketing. They need to be married, uh, work at digital marketing show, and they went to school at, um, at the LSE. Uh, here's £2.50 Facebook. Tell me how many people it'll reach. Put my content in front of them specifically. Uh, again, you can be super targeted about where you use it. No more of this random pushing lots of content out and hoping someone will see it. Similar again for Twitter, does a similar thing, paid media, a little bit more expensive. Uh, I'm not going to go through it in detail, but same premise, target people, put a bit of budget towards it, £5, £10, £20, get it in front of people um, that actually want to see your content uh, as opposed to blasting it out. Uh, final tip, apologies a little bit late. Um, 
the new age of storytelling, content production, uh, content curation. We've lived through 70 years of hard work, right? TV, radio, above the line advertising, rate, white papers, articles, presentations. Um, and we live in a, a new age of storytelling. Storytelling is being used quite a lot. It's becoming a little bit cliche now. Um, but effectively, what I mean is we live in the age of bite-sized media, right? 140 characters. How can I communicate with someone in 140 characters? Uh, the latest report was that w uh, said that we have an attention span of five seconds um, as we're doing this through our phones flicking through the feeds, flicking through Facebook, flicking through Twitter and our emails. And we have five seconds to capture someone's attention on a screen the size of our palm, the palm of our hands. Um, so we need to be thinking about how people consume that content when we create it. Anything more than a sentence on any platform, people are not going to read. If you want to put more, make that sentence super catchy, super valuable, super targeted, and click them off to a site, or get them to sign up to a newsletter, or something they can do in five seconds. Um, we need to be thinking about content curation slightly differently. I don't know if anyone recognizes this guy, um, Commander Christopher Hadfield. He's a very talented guy. He doesn't look like it here. Um, <laughs> he's a, a musician, a skateboarder, an artist, uh, and he uh, drives spaceships for a living. Um, last year, he got back from a nine-month stint on the ISS, the International Space Station. Uh, he's an internet rock star in his own right. He did a rendition of Ground Control to Major Tom, Space Odyssey, David Bowie, and that's why he had the painted face spinning around in his space to playing the guitar. It's actually quite cool. Uh, quite a few people like it, as you can see. Um, but uh, when I was at Hootsuite, we were very fortunate enough to have, us, uh, have him at our offices um, for a fireside chat. And someone asked him, um, what do you think the best social media campaign has ever been? Um, and I hate that question. And luckily, there's no time for a Q&A, so no one can ask me that. Um, but after a little while of uh, thinking about it, he said, um, the moon landing. So it's all of us at the office like thinking we're, uh, we should know this. We're, we're in the industry looking around. What was he using? Message boards, ICQ, MSN chat, IRC chat rooms. What were people using? Uh, and he said, back then, what, what Mike, Buzz uh, did and the crew did was the first time that the world took something someone was doing or a group of people were doing, beamed it down to the earth, and everyone was having the same conversation at the same time about the same thing. Um, and, that's, and something really resonated with me in the fact that nothing has changed. Our, our innate human desire to have a conversation with each other hasn't changed. Um, and that's all social media is. Technology has changed. Um, Technology has allowed us to have a lot more conversations, a lot faster at scale. You've probably heard the, the phrase social media is just word of mouth on steroids. Uh, it's just lots of people having lots of conversations at the same time. Um, but that hasn't changed. Um, and that's what content should be doing, uh, looking to create a conversation with our customers so that we can then start to build a relationship with them and build that, that ad loyalty and advocacy uh, with them. Um, I'm going to flick over this because we haven't got any time. Yep. It's just an example of a, a content um, piece. Uh, the point being, we don't all have to jump out of spaceships uh, in the sky, uh, spaceships. Chris Havfield, balloons in space um, to garner attention. We don't have to have big budgets. Um, we have to think about how our content resonates with, with the audience. If we can inspire people, educate people, entertain people, drive a conversation of some sort with a much smaller a group of customers, we can get that, that natural virality sharing and actually get people to see the content. A couple of tools. Hootsuite, again, has a suggested content feature. Um, you'll see, type it into Google, Hootsuite suggested content. Basically, you plug in a load of keywords, and it'll come back and suggest posts for you or pre-populate them, create them. You can even click schedule them, and it'll schedule them directly to your platforms. Word of warning, I'll caveat that with I don't actually advocate people automate this kind of stuff. Um, but what it will do is actually give you an indication of the types of things you can talk about, what's being shared. It has an algorithm that works out content that's most shared, so you can see what is being shared, which could give you some good content ideas. Um, Buffer, uh, another great tool. You might have, you might have heard of it. Uh, another free tool, uh, very similar to, to Hootsuite, but just allows you to schedule across multiple profiles. Um, but what's really great about it is it has a, um, a browser extension. So wherever you're sharing, on, wherever you're looking around on the web, you, literally you can just click on one. If you see a good article, good photo, something that you want to share, one button, it automatically fires it out to your social networks. Uh, great for content curation, creation, saves you time and effort having to actually create a content plan or an editorial calendar. You can just do it while you're browsing around the web, do it there, and then get content out that you think might be useful and valuable for your uh, audiences. 
um, Canva for creating images. Um, fantastic uh, piece of software. Um, basically allows you to create these style of images. Has a stock library, a uh, royalty free stock library of about a million different backgrounds and photos. All these different fonts. Beautiful. You just create, put your, um, put your text uh, or copy on there. Uh, anything you want to put in there and it will create it. Click basically what platform you want to publish it to and it will automatically resize it to the platform you want to publish it out. Um, great for visual, uh, all the visual content, visual platforms like Instagram, perfect. Canva will save you a ton of time creating images. Um, and then also Infogram, uh, infographics you would have heard a lot about if you've been in marketing. It's kind of had its crest, I suppose. Uh, but actually, the, the visual marketing aspect of it is, is super key. As you mentioned, as I mentioned, people have a five second, five second attention span. What's the best way to capture their attention? Fill up as much of the screen as possible. Um, it's really hard. It's really easy to miss some copy only in a tweet or a Facebook post. Stick an image or video on, in it. And it's basic form, it actually just takes up more real estate on the screen, so it's harder to miss. Um, so I'd always say try and put as much rich content, visuals, videos in, in, your, in your post as possible. Um, this is free, it's great, you can just plug in a load of data and it'll create beautiful in, uh, in, infographics for you um, that you can publish out. Um, and that was my last, my last tool. Just want to end off uh, with spoken to a, a lot of, I was just wondering why I, why I put a massive heart in the, the middle of the screen uh, and there's innovation there, but what I wanted to end up with is a lot of marketers uh, kind of fall into the trap of um, worrying about the platforms that they're using, the technology they're using. I've spoken a lot about the tools that will help you, um, but a lot of marketers fall into the trap of worrying about what my Facebook strategy is, what's my Pinterest strategy, what's my Snapchat strategy, should I be on Periscope, um, should I be a meerkat? Um, I'm mad at Facebook because organic reach is now 1.5% and I have to pay for attention. Um, but they fall into the trap of missing the point, as I mentioned, of, of social, in that if you put yourselves in the position of the customer, the consumer, the prospect, the person that you actually want to have a conversation with, um, the person that you want to build a relationship either to sell with, to partner with, to... Um, a journalist that might go in ahead and publish your content, whoever it might be, if you put yourself in their position and go through that journey, um, go through the journey that they go through to actually talk to you, what do they click on on my website? Why would I actually speak to them? What are the barriers of actually talking to them? If I click on this Facebook profile, have I got the information I need? If you simply put yourself in the, the position of the customer and consumer and do a little mini exercise of that process and just map it out, you start to then get the gift of empathy for for that consumer. You start to feel like what they, they feel. You start to understand the challenges um, that they go through. Um, and you start to then create a much more customer focused, customer centric strategy based on what they actually find valuable. Far too many times have I spoken to, to clients, to businesses, they've just reeled off all of these platforms they're on, all of this content. It's my last slide. All of this content that I'm creating, far too many times do people just publish content, throw spaghetti at the wall, um, be super focused. Doing one platform very well is much better than six averagely. Um, focus your time, know exactly who you want to speak to, what you want to say to them, um, and build a strategy based on that. It doesn't have to be consuming. There's lots of technology, time consuming. There's lots of technology that will help you automate that. Just be focused about it, and you'll stand a much better chance of actually talking to people you want to talk to and actually driving value, business value from, from those people.